Animals first appeared over 600 million years ago, and in that time they have diversified wildly. However, the phenomena known as convergent evolution has led to wildly different organisms evolving the same structures or strategies. Today, we'll look at five interesting examples. Sabertooth cats are some of the most notorious animals of all time, famously battling our ancestors and being a large part of the image we have of the Ice Age. But saber teeth have actually evolved a number of times throughout the synapsid family tree. While saber tooth cats may be the most well known, the iconic canines first appear with the Gorgonopsids. These were large, warm blooded predators who were probably covered in hair and laid eggs. They lived around 260 million years ago during the Permian period and were the top predators of their ecosystems, with the largest exceeding 1,000 pounds or 450 kilograms. 40 million years ago, a family of carnivorans appeared in North America known as the Nimravids, or often called the false saber-tooth cats. Carnivorans include everything from cats to bears to walruses, and within the carnivorans, Nimravids were feliforms, along with hyenas, cats, and mongoose. Nimravids were around for around 32 million years, and the largest were as large as tigers. Their success was closely tied to thick, humid forests, and they went extinct in North America around 23 million years ago. Some Nimravids had migrated to Asia, and they had success for a while longer, but eventually all went extinct as recently as 8 million years ago. More recently, around 3 million years ago, a marsupial predator stalked around South America. This was Thylacosmilus, and its ancestors split from saber-toothed cats over 145 million years ago. But despite that, it eventually developed the same saber teeth. While they evolved a very similar structure, there were some differences. First, the saber teeth of Thylacosmilus grew continuously, whereas the saber teeth of saber toothed cats grew once and if they were broken could never grow back. Second, their canines had a shearing edge on the backside, so the teeth could be pulled backwards to cut flesh like a knife. Hummingbirds play a big role in North and South American ecosystems and are known for their massive migrations as well as their extreme metabolisms. There are at least 366 living species, all of which are contained in the Americas. But overseas in Eurasia, another animal buzzes around flowers. At first sight, this might seem to be a hummingbird, but in fact, it's a large species of moth, aptly named the hummingbird hawk moth. Like actual hummingbirds, it is nectivorous. It uses a long proboscis resembling the beaks and tongues of hummingbirds to feed, and it produces a distinct buzzing sound as it flies around. It resembles a hummingbird so much that it can be mistaken for one on occasion, despite hummingbirds only being present in the New World. Why they so closely resemble hummingbirds is unclear. There is a group of birds who are very distantly related to hummingbirds known as the sunbirds. These birds live in Eurasia and Africa, are nectivorous, and share lots of anatomical features with hummingbirds. Despite this, the last ancestor of these two groups lived 80 million years ago and did not closely resemble the current forms of either group, making it another example of convergent evolution. However, the range of sunbirds only overlaps with hummingbird hawk moths and does not totally match it. Additionally, what benefit resembling these birds would bring is unknown, indicating that the resemblance is due to the adaptation for the same lifestyle as well as being a result of random chance. Stingrays are a group of chondrichthyes that emerged around 150 million years ago. But over 360 million years ago, a totally different order of fish looked almost identical to them. The renonids were an order of scaly placoderms with very unique anatomy. They had a mosaic of thick scales as their armor, as opposed to the large plates of their close relatives. Like stingrays, renonids had wide, flat bodies with a long, thin tail, and their eyes on the top of their heads. This similarity is because both groups adapted to the same lifestyle, being bottom-dwelling predators who would have searched for prey along and in the sediment. A difference in anatomy between these two groups is that stingrays have their mouths on the underside of their bodies, whereas renodids had their mouths on the front of their bodies. Additionally, ray's eyes are facing to the side, whereas renodids would face more up. Renodids died out around 358 million years ago at the end of the Devonian, but rays did not appear until around 170 million years ago, meaning that while the form has evolved more than once, the world was free of fish closely resembling either group for almost 200 million years. 
When we think of jet propulsion in animals, it brings to mind squid and octopi. They use a cavity in their body which they fill with water and then shoot out. But cephalopods are not the only animals which use jet propulsion. Scallops also use jet propulsion, using this to bob away through the water to escape predators. Sea hares too use a primitive version of jet propulsion to push themselves through the water for the same purpose. Another group uses jet propulsion, arthropods, specifically dragonflies. While adult dragonflies of course do not use jet propulsion and instead fly, dragonfly nymphs use jet propulsion while underwater. They collect water in a cavity of their bodies and then shoot it out of their anus, propelling themselves suddenly and quickly forward, using this primarily to escape from predators. Eyes are some of the most complex natural structures in the universe. They are so complex, in fact, that many have believed that they cannot possibly have evolved on their own. But in fact, eyes have evolved multiple times throughout the animal kingdom. While some of these eyes are relatively simple, like those of flatworms, or are just wildly different in structure like those of arthropods, the eyes of vertebrates and cephalopods are remarkably similar in structure. In fact, they are nearly identical. Both eyes have a lens, a ciliary muscle, a semisphere of photoreceptor cells, and both even have a colored iris. The biggest difference in structure between the two eyes is that the nerve fibers run behind the photoreceptor cells in the cephalopod eye, meaning that they do not have the blind spot we do. And they also lack the bipolar cells in vertebrate eyes, likely due to the neurology related to the retina structure in cephalopods. However, the cephalopod eye has undergone some specialization. The eyes of cuttlefish often have a unique W shape. This is an adaptation to a few factors. The environments they live in are very varied in terms of their light levels, so the unique shape of the eye helps them filter unwanted light. Second, the extended shape of the eye allows them a wide range of vision, which is useful in a predator-filled ocean. Finally, cephalopods only have one kind of color-sensitive protein, meaning that they cannot interpret the different wavelengths hitting the retina but the unique shape allows them to take advantage of the different sizes of the wavelengths, filtering or directing different wavelengths and allowing them to interpret color differences. The complex cephalopod eye appeared around 450 million years ago, while the vertebrate camera eye appeared earlier, around 500 million years ago. While some argue that the camera eye, or at least a primitive version of it, was present in the common ancestor of these two groups, this ancestor lived about 750 million years ago, and was very different and much simpler than either group. So it is far more likely that the two lineages evolved their eyes independently, from creatures that had things as simple as eye spots, patches of photoreceptor cells only meant to detect light or dark. If you enjoyed, make sure to like and subscribe, and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Have a good day everyone.